The next decade will redefine how the world is powered. So let's understand the system we're trying to change. Here's three different ways of thinking about energy systems. When our cavemen ancestors learned how to harness fire, they also invented the first energy system. It's about as simple as an energy system can get, but it has all the features of a modern energy system, and we can break these down into three major components. First of all, there was a demand for energy services, in this case, warmth and cooking. Secondly, there was a supply of energy, the wood that was burnt. And the third component is infrastructure, which links the supply and the demand. In this case, it's the ability to cut wood and transport it to where it's needed. There was even some basic energy storage in this early energy system, a dry wood pile, which provided ongoing security of supply. Now, modern energy systems also feature these three key components of demand, supply and infrastructure. Energy demand is driven by the myriad of things that we use energy for, which we've already covered in our video on energy services. In the modern world, the supply of energy now comes from a range of sources, the fossil fuels of coal, oil and gas, as well as nuclear fuel and tapping renewable flows in the environment, such as hydro, wind, solar and biomass. Infrastructure is the often forgotten component, but it includes the pipes and ships that connect sources of gas to boilers and electricity networks that connect power stations to buildings. One important thing to note here, electricity is not a fuel, it has to be made somehow. Electricity's great usefulness is as a means of transporting energy from one place to another, and for that reason electricity is often called secondary energy or an energy vector. Other energy vectors include hydrogen and ammonia. They too need to be produced, but have potential uses in moving and storing energy. Supply, demand and infrastructure are intrinsically linked. Changes in one component has knock-on impacts on the other two. So it's vital to think of them as a whole system. Simple arguments that just focus on one aspect tend to underestimate the complexity of the problem and the scale of change needed. Here's an example. What would it take for us to decarbonize car transport? Arguments like, we just need more renewables or we need to stop burning oil, whilst ultimately true, don't capture the full extent of the change needed. In practice, we would need changes across the whole system would need changes on the demand side to swap every internal combustion engine vehicle for an electric one. We'd need an infrastructure change to replace all of the petrol stations with millions of electric vehicle chargers at home and in public locations. And this in turn may need some upgrades of the electricity network. On top of that, we'd need a change on the supply side by building more zero carbon sources of power to supply electricity to those vehicles. That extra complexity and the time needed to implement it is why we talk about an energy transition, a structural change to the entire energy system, including how energy is produced, distributed and consumed. We can actually draw a map of energy systems using a visualisation called a Sankey diagram like this example from the UK. On the left hand side we have a range of energy supply technologies and on the right a range of energy demands. The lines linking them together represent the infrastructure including power stations and the thickness of each line represents the amount of energy flowing in one year. It's really complicated, certainly much more going on here than in the simple energy system of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. There's lots of different supply technologies in a modern energy system and multiple sets of infrastructure delivering energy to a huge range of different residential, commercial and industrial end uses. Let me introduce you to a second way of thinking about energy systems. In the first part of this video, I've talked about energy as a technical system of supply, demand and infrastructure. And this is how an engineer might look 
at an energy system as physical assets connected to a grid or pipeline network. But take a look at these infographics. They're quite a common way of visualising what a future energy system might look like, and they include everything you might expect to see – wind turbines, solar panels, electric cars and batteries, and so forth. But they're missing one important thing – where are all the people? Where are the people actually driving those electric cars? Where are the people who are owning, operating or building generators? We can extend our definition of an energy system into something a little bit broader by including the people and institutions within our energy system and considering the different ways in which people interact with energy. Here's some of the different roles. As consumers of energy and the ways we use different appliances and transport modes. This may change over time as people adopt greener lifestyles and take decisions to alter their usage patterns. There's financial interactions, when you pay your utility bill and the tariffs that you might choose. You may also invest in electricity generation assets, either directly or by your pension. Some people may also be generators of electricity in their own homes from solar panels or add flexibility to the electricity network through batteries. And then there's the people who build and maintain generators and infrastructure or work for the energy utilities. Last, there's people who work on energy policy within government or in industry regulators. All of these people interact with the energy system in different ways and they shape how it operates. So it makes sense that we should include these people and their interactions in what we consider an energy system. Looking at an energy system in this way is more similar to the worlds of biology and ecology. The energy transition isn't just about swapping one technology for another. It's about reshaping an entire ecosystem. Here's a third way of looking at energy systems, which comes from the world of chaos theory and systems thinking. It considers a system as a series of positive and negative feedback loops interacting with each other. The first type of feedback loop is called a reinforcing feedback loop, where doing more of something results in even more of that thing happening. Let's take the case of wind turbines. Installing wind turbines results in economies of scale and mass production, which brings down the price, resulting in it being more economically attractive to install even more wind turbines. The second is a type of feedback loop called a balancing feedback loop, where doing more of something results in less of that thing happening. To continue with our wind turbine analogy, as you install more wind turbines, the best sites get used up, forcing developers towards sites with lower wind speeds where the economics are not so good. This will put the brakes on the deployment of wind turbines. So which one of these two feedback loops wins out? Well, ultimately, it's difficult to say which is one of the reasons why systems thinking is so complex. If you think that's hard, then consider this. A complete energy system would have feedback loops for every different supply technology, and for every different energy demand, and all the infrastructure requirements. Those feedback loops could be based around technology development, capital cost, fuel price, policy interventions, carbon limits, social attitudes, resource availability, the availability of skilled labour and infrastructure constraints. I think you can start to see that the sheer complexity of the number of completing factors that build up an energy system. The net result of this is that energy systems can behave in surprising and non-linear ways. Recently, there's been a sudden and astronomical rise of solar photovoltaics in Pakistan, where the combination of high electricity prices, low solar panel prices, and a solid and skilled engineering base hit a tipping point, resulting in an explosion of installed solar. Solar was just 4% of Pakistan's electricity in 2021, but by 2025 it was the largest single source of power accounting for 25% of electricity in the country. It's a great example of how a small adjustment in a few of these feedback loops can change the picture very dramatically and very quickly. To sum up, 
When we look beyond fuels and power stations, we start to see energy systems for what they truly are. They're living ecosystems made up of technologies, infrastructures, people, choices, and with feedback loops constantly shaping and reshaping one another. That's why simple slogans rarely capture the scale of change required. But it's also the reason why rapid, surprising shifts are possible. By recognising the full complexity of energy systems, we put ourselves in a better position to guide them towards outcomes that are sustainable, equitable and resilient. Positive feedback loops don't just happen in energy systems, they happen on YouTube too. Likes and subscriptions can tell the algorithm to share Energy 101 with even more people.